Good evening. It is 6 p.m. on Monday, March 13th, 2023, and I am Kathy Sizemore, Chair of the Temecula Community Services Commission, and I'm calling this Community Services Commission meeting to order. First item is to um, begin with our flag salute. Commissioner Hawks, will you please lead us in that tonight? Yes, Lee. Right. Put your hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Would our secretary please take roll? Commissioner Hawks? Here. Commissioner Kingsburg? Here. Vice Chair Audi? Here. Chairperson Sizemore? Here. All present with the exception of Commissioner Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. I was going to say thank you, Mrs. Quartz. I don't think it's, is it Mrs. Quartz? It'll be Mrs. Tominez once I go through all the legalities. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. All right, uh, we do not have any public comments, so we will dispense with the reading of the rules for that, which will take us, we are actually gonna be moving up our business item of receiving and filing a budget engagement session. We will be moving that up and we will receive that from Jennifer Hennessy. Thank you. Tonight's item is the budget engagement session. And we do this each year with each of the boards and commissions um, at the beginning of our budget process. And so many of you I've spoke to last year, so it's somewhat of a repeat, but I'll give you an update on our budget process, um, certain key budget policies that help us create the budget document. Uh, we'll go over the fiscal year 22-23 highlights. And then we have some discussion questions at the end but I'm also gonna give them to you in the beginning so you can kind of think about them throughout the presentation and then we'll circle, circle back at the end with some discussion. So the questions are, as a commissioner, do you feel that the city's investment in financial resources is in line with the community's priorities? And then if yes, which programs or projects are most beneficial to the community? And then if not, how could the city better align its spending with the community's priorities? So we begin our budget process in January of each year where we review the current year's budgeted revenues and expenditures and then we also update our five-year financial projections. And then that information is used um, to bring the mid-year budget update to the council in February of each year. And then we also begin the next fiscal year's budget process for the annual operating budget and the capital improvement program budget. And then throughout February and March, we meet, meet with each of the boards and commissions uh, to do the budget engagement sessions. And really the goal here is to gain feedback from you all uh, from what you're hearing through your channels in the community so that we can relay that feedback back to the council as part of the budget process. And then in March and April, staff develops the proposed annual budget, work, uh, the annual operating budget and CIP, and that, that's presented to the council in May at their daytime budget workshop. It's usually the third Thursday in May. And that's when the council will review the proposed budget and CIP. And then if they come up with any changes that they'd like to see reflected in the next year's budget, then we will incorporate those into uh, the adopted budget that is presented to the council in June. And then throughout the fiscal year, um, finance staff works with departments to review their budget to actual trends on revenues and expenditures uh, and make sure that we're in alignment with the budget and if any adjustments might need to be made then we bring those forward to the council as need be. Uh, the development of the budget, uh, we utilize several different tools to develop the appropriation recommendations. The first of which is actually the middle on the page here called prior year carryover to complete projects. So what this represents is any programs or projects that may have been started in the prior fiscal year that uh, weren't quite finished, we wanna make sure that the funding is available to bring those projects to completion, so those items are budgeted first. And then we use a variety of feedback mechanisms through, oops, there's a bug flying around. 
through a community satisfaction surveys where we reach out to residents of the community and gain their input on their priorities and maybe some areas of concern. Uh, we are scheduled to do another community survey uh, next fiscal year, so that'll be included in next year's budget. And then we, prov uh, we utilize the feedback that we gain from the boards and commissions. And then we also look at the various program and services master plans that the city has, similar or like the uh, parks master plan or senior master plan. And we look at any programs that are outlined in those uh, that need to be incorporated in either the CIP or the annual operating budget, and we include those. And then, as I mentioned, there's several city council policies that set different thresholds and reserve requirements and things of that nature. So we uh, presented to the council in February, uh, to which they gave us their input on, on the uh, different policies that create thresholds and whatnot. So those have been um, affirmed for this next budget cycle as well. And then throughout our process, we have three key deliverables, uh, the first of which is called the preliminary budget, and that's an internal document that contains all of the department requests for the next year's fiscal budget. And then that is created um, in the March-April timeframe. That's reviewed with the city manager, who then creates his recommendations in what we call the proposed budget, and that's what is presented to the council in May. And then that's where all the feedback from these budget engagement sessions will be reflected in that proposed budget and presented to the council at their workshop. And then the third deliverable is the adopted budget. So that's our final operating and capital program budget. And that is always um, presented to the council at the first meeting in June and adopted in time to um, become our formal spending plan for July 1, which starts the next fiscal year. And this is the exhibit of what the feedback looks like to, uh, that's provided to the council. So we have a segment for each of the uh, boards and commissions, and then any commonalities that we hear throughout all the different boards and commissions we put in the center, um, and then those are highlighted to the council um, so that they can hear what the common suggestions are between all the different boards and commissions. And you can see last year, uh, maintaining investment in public safety uh, remains a top priority, addressing traffic congestion and affordable housing, and then continuing our, our outreach and engagement with the community those were common themes that we heard throughout each of the boards and commissions. So we'll update this, um, this uh, after tonight's meeting, since this is the last of the budget engagement sessions, and then we'll be providing that to council as well. So I mentioned some budget policies. Um, we have one that's, um, that helps us uh, determine how much uh, or how to program prior year available general fund balance. So the general fund is the city's primary operating fund. It is unrestricted so long as it's spent for a public purpose. And any monies at the end of a fiscal year that are not set aside in reserves or programmed for the next year are what we call available fund balance. And the council has adopted appropriation priorities for available fund balance, um, the first of which is to spend on public safety equipment or non-recurring programs. And again, this is um, considered one-time money, so we want to match that with one-time expenditures um, as opposed to ongoing expenditures like increasing staffing or things of that nature. So the first priority is public safety. The second priority is asset management reserves. So these are little savings accounts that have been set up so that we have enough money to replace vehicles when they reach the end of their useful life or have enough money to repair the roof on our facilities, things like that, different asset management reserves. Capital improvement projects, um, that's a good use of one-time funding. And then the next two are the reduction of unfunded liabilities um, or debt, and then either the reduction or the avoidance of city debt. And these two come into play in a few slides forward that I'll show you what this council recently adopted. Another policy is the Measure S appropriation guidelines. So Measure S was approved by the voters in 2016. It's a one cent sales tax. And at that time, the council um, put in these appropriation guidelines prioritizing Measure S to be spent on public safety, again, asset management, uh, capital projects, and then finally general services or community services. And a large, large portion of uh, community services is funded directly from Measure S. Um, and then as time goes by, uh, and the costs of public safety and community services increase, there'll be less and less available for 
capital projects. So we have that factored in our long-term plans accordingly. So I mentioned one of the uses of available fund balance was to pay down debt. And back in December, the council adopted uh, what we're calling our debt and liability pay down strategy. And what the goal of this strategy was to do is to become debt free in seven years. So with that, we were able to utilize available fund balance plus some funding that we had set aside in a third party trust uh, for pension purposes. And then any future savings that the pay down of debt creates will be targeted to these four debt types. So we have a civic center loan, 12.9 million, a loan on the Margarita Recreation Center that's under construction right now. That was part of the funding for that project. And then we have two unfunded liabilities, one related to pension, and then the other related to what is called OPEB, or other post-employment benefits, which is basically retiree health, which was a benefit that the city provided to employees prior to 2005. Uh, so you can kind of see the amount outstanding uh, for each of the debt types and then the annual cost to service that debt. And since December, we have actually paid off the Civic Center loan, uh, the MRC loan, and 7.25 million of the pension liability. And then our plan next year is to utilize um, almost $11 million of available fund balance combined with $5 million from the pension trust to pay down the OPEB liability and then continue to pay down more and more of the pension liability. And then if all things go as planned, um, we will be debt free in seven years. And then what that does is that creates an additional eight to eight and a half million dollars in our operating budget uh, that is an ongoing funding source for future projects or potential increases in program or, or service delivery. Um, the quality of life master plan that was just adopted has several projects way out in the future that don't have funding sources. So this could be a funding source to address some of those programs and projects outlined in the QLMP. This is just another illustration of the annual savings um, and what we have paid off to date. We've achieved um, at a minimum $3 million um, a year in savings for the next uh, nine years. And then that tapers off as the natural payoff of the Civic Center and the MRC uh, would have been paid off. So next year we will, oh, what happened? Um, next year um, we'll pay off the blue portion of the OPEB savings and then continually pay off the pension um, until it's all paid off by year eight. So some budget highlights for the current fiscal year. Um, the general fund revenue uh, is projected to come in a little over 111 million. And what's notable on this slide is um, the chart illustrates our revenues compared to our expenditures. And the revenues are indicated by the black line, um, which is higher or exceeding the expenditures shown in the blue bars. And that's important because that indicates that the city is structurally balanced financially. Um, we're, we do not operate in a deficit situation, nor do we project that we will be over the next five years. Um, we are projecting a slowdown in the economy over the next year. So you can see where that black line sort of flattens out between fiscal year 22, 23, and fiscal year 23, 24. That's um, to reflect a potential contraction in the economy that some economists say will happen, some don't. So we sort of picked a middle ground and we're showing it being flattened out so that we are projecting revenues conservatively. On the expenditure side, a um, little more than half of the general fund is spent towards public safety. And um, one thing to note on the fire budget of 11.2 million, <clears throat> That, that is net of what is called the fire tax credit. So every resident within Temecula who pays property taxes pays into a fire tax credit, and the county applies that. It, it's roughly $10 million. So they apply that towards our fire contract first, and then bill us what's remaining. So the total fire budget really is about $21 million, <clears throat> but the city only pays 11.2. So you can see our expenditures are projected just over $93 million. Um, the bulk of which I said uh, goes to public safety, and then uh, public works takes up about 20%. Community development, which includes planning and building services, code enforcement, that's about 9%. And then you have administration at 14%.
And then this slide shows the ending fund balance. Uh, so we're projecting a little over 37 million at the end of this fiscal year. Um, of that, we set aside monies into reserves. So we have two separate reserves, one called the Reserve for Economic Uncertainty, and that'll be funded at about 18.6 million. And then we have a secondary reserve, 4.6 million. And the reason they're broken out is one, they have different criteria on what it takes to tap into those reserves. Um, and it's, it's important to note that the city's never had to tap into their reserves, even through the Great Recession or through COVID. Uh, we were able to absorb the economic impacts just by adjusting our operating budget downward um, to absorb the loss in revenue. And then on the chart, you can see the blue bars indicate the fund balance, and you can see that big decline between 22 and 22, 23, and that was the pay down of that debt obligation for this building and the MRC that we mentioned a little while ago. Um, but it is important to show that we meet our desired reserves each year uh, in the next five years and have even a little extra available fund balance in each of the five years as well. So we have a five-year capital improvement program. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large CIP for a city our size, uh, 106 different projects totaling $801 million. Um, 518 million of that are the, is the projected budget. Uh, we've already spent 283 million. And we segregate our CIP into four different categories, uh, circulation, infrastructure, parks and rec, and SARTA, which is also known as affordable housing. And here's some of the highlights of the big, bigger projects that are in our current CIP. Um, so we have 31 different projects in circulation. That is by far our largest segment of the CIP. Um, and the biggest project uh, is the French Valley Parkway Phase 2. That's due to get started here uh, next month, and that'll be about a two-year-long project. And then we have Murrieta Creek Bridge at Overland, uh, Nicholas Road Extensions. We're still gathering up the funding for that. Um, pavement rehab projects, so that's an annual program that repaves or um, redoes the, uh, the roads and auxiliary lanes throughout the city. I'm not saying that right. There's another word for it. I can't think of it. Artilleries. That's what it is, artillery lanes. Uh, and then we have the I-15 congestion relief where they will be building auxiliary lanes, um, so an extra lane between Temecula Parkway and Rancho Cal going northbound. So that'll start probably in the summertime. And then on the infrastructure project side, we have 52 different projects. Um, the largest one right now is the MRC, which I'm sure you are all very familiar with. And then the CRC renovation, um, also I'm sure you're familiar with that. And then we just recently finished a, uh, the Santa Gertrudis uh, Creek Pedestrian Bicycle Trail Extension. And then we have a fiber optic communication systems upgrade programmed as well for this year. And then the Park and Recs projects, um, 20 of them, totaling about 47 million. Um, the CRC splash pad and shade structures, that's a big one. The pickleball courts, this one will be revisited when we update the CIP um, to reflect the latest and greatest uh, decision on how many courts and where and all of that. And then we have that placeholder of 8 million for the Murrieta Creek Regional Sports Park. Uh, and then we have the two at Ronald Reagan Sports Park for the upgrading of the skate park and the hockey rink. And then finally, under SARTA, or affordable housing, we have three separate projects. Um, Las Hacientas is underway right now, and that will provide 77 units of multifamily development over in Uptown. And then we have the Vine Creek affordable housing project. I'm not sure exactly when that one's due to get started, um, but it is a 100% affordable project that will provide 60 different units. And then we have a project for, with Habitat for Humanity uh, that will pr provide six for sale units as opposed to rental units. And then finally, this is the chart that shows the city's headcount. Um, we have uh, 196.45 <laughs> authorized positions. And those are full-time equivalent positions. And in addition to that, we have several part-time or project positions, um, primarily to help TCSD with their programming um, day camp, lifeguards, things of that nature. And then we have public safety personnel that's provided through contracts with the county. Uh, we have 71 fire personnel and 136 police personnel. 
So with that, we will circle back to the discussion questions again. Um, so as a commissioner, do you feel that the city's investment in financial resources is in line with the community's priorities? And if so, what programs or projects are most beneficial? And then if not, how can the city better align its spending with the community priorities? And I am available for any questions, or we can jump into the discussion questions. Up to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. That was very thorough. You put a lot of time and a lot of work into it, Thank and you. Uh, we appreciate that. I will start with uh, Vice Chair Audie. Your comments? I echo what the chair says. I mean, just so impressive mm -hmm. of where we are today. I mean, getting through those two major. Um, situations with the Great Recession, the pandemic, didn't even tap into our reserves, um, paying off debt, just unbelievable, and you get a lot of credit for that. Thank you so much for all of that great work. Thank you. Um, the other thing you do well is come and explain these things to us and um, give us a better understanding of where the money is being spent. I'm very happy with um, what I see the money going to um, in regard to community services, um, some great infrastructure projects, and um, the, one, the one page you had with the SIP funds, it, it was really good because everything, all the pictures you had on that page were all you know very active things. You had the pickleball, the, um, I guess you had a, a an infrastructure building a trail or something and then the rec center so um, the fact that we're putting money into an active and healthy community we're meeting the needs of the quality life master plan um, I do agree that we are spending money on our priorities and the number one priority being safety and traffic um, I would like to see more of the spending plan include like I suggested last year if we're talking circulation and traffic we should also be talking active transportation along with that mm -hmm. we we tend to view it as our public space for cars as opposed to public space for people mm -hmm. and that was taken into account in this year's budget and I'm very happy about that um, this year I would like to see more of the traffic be included in that safety plan um, a safe a safe community um, to have a safe community it's incumbent on how we spend money on our public spaces and um, that's the one thing i would like to see but other than that um, agree we are spending our money on our community's priorities and we are spending it on safety which is where you have to start okay so thank you thank you thank you vice chair Audie. commissioner hall agree with the vice chair that uh, we're spending money on the priority and on the perspective from community services i think i like to see improvement on our existing parks and i believe we have plans in place mm -hmm. we have a presentation last month every time i go to parks i see families are enjoying parks so i think if we can continue to improve our existing parks and build new parks that'll be great benefit for our community. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Kingsley. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. I know budgets are complex documents and uh, you definitely made it digestible for us and, and gave us some good highlights. I mean, being new, relatively new to this commission, I was trying to find community services um, within the budget and I think I did in a few places. Obviously, I'm just gonna take a few guesses here. With personnel, obviously, I mean, uh, people are, are, are critical. Um, I, um, I, my first place I went was community development, but then as you described it, it sounds, didn't sound like that necessarily fit community services, uh, and maybe you can clarify that, but then um, uh, also obviously in, in many of the, uh, the CIP projects. So mm -hmm. could you share a little bit about where community services fits into the budget? Yeah, um, it's actually in its own section um, okay. under, we call it TCSD, Temecula Community Services okay. District. And then within the Capital Improvement Program budget, there, are, there is a separate section for parks and recreation. Okay. Um, that, you know, includes a lot of the 
the community services related projects. Um, some of the larger infrastructure projects are included in the infrastructure section, um, like the Margarita Rec yes. Center. But the Parks and Rec is specifically Parks and Rec. Okay. And then the TCSD budget is specifically TCSD. Great, great. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, yeah, and just just to agree with what's been said so far, I mean, I to see all these streams leading to a strong reserve fund. That That's great. Um, I did want to comment a little bit on affordable housing. I know that's kind of a politically charged topic right now. I know council's supposed to take it on uh, or, or be a report on that tomorrow night. And, and there, there's a lot of things that the city is doing. And there, there are a lot of factors that are probably outside of the city's control. Um, I, in my unofficial research, I, I found that about one third of our residents or maybe a little more are renters, not owners. I don't know if that's correct, but that's what I, what I digged out today. Um, I know I bought my first house here 34 years ago at $102,000. I know, I know those days are long gone. Um, and we're not going to go, we're not going to go back. Uh, but I, I just wanted to make a statement that I know renters monthly obligation are, are, can be more than those of us that have a, a fixed mortgage. I know we all know this. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what's, what's going to come, come forward. And, and I'm pleased to see those things that you, you listed because I, I'm speculating that demographically it's, it's a challenge probably to keep our young talent here. Uh, I know I've had a chance to meet some great young talent that I've had a chance to work with in this department under TCSD. And, um, you know, I, 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 we know that it's harder for younger people to afford uh, to get in the housing market here and, and to stay. So uh, I appreciate you guys addressing that and continuing to move, move forward in any way you can. So thank you. Great. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, again, I would just uh, commend you, Director Hennessy, and all your work in putting this together. Um, I also just want to tell you I appreciate your, your planning and your prudence in protecting a reserve for our city. You've really helped to put our city in a good position for the future. Looking at the uh, budget, I do see the needs and the desires of our residents reflected. Uh, number one priority always being safety, followed by traffic mitigation and quality of life. I would echo what Commissioner Audi mentioned about it would be nice to see the active transportation um, reflected under our, our traffic budget also, or improving mm -hmm. traffic, because I do, as uh, options for micro mobility have increased, I do see that active um, transportation network being something that can help to uh, mitigate our traffic concerns in the city. And one thing that I do, um, I saw that was last year on the slide that came out of our commission was the preserving open space. Mm -hmm. That is, number number one thing I hear is from people is we want to be safe. Number two, traffic. Number three, traffic. Number four, traffic. <laughs> number five thing I hear, pickleball. Number six is, um, I just wish we had parks where it was just a park with just open space mm. that I could walk around and see trees. So, okay. so that would be... Those would be my comments. Thank you for coming here tonight. We All right. Thank you very here. much. Appreciate it. All right. We will now go to our division reports, and we'll have our first report, our recreation report. Thank you, Jennifer. From Hilda Nieto. Did I say that right? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for being here tonight. I don't think I recall. Have you been here with us before? Not here, but I met you before at the Senior Center. Okay. So. All right. Well, yeah. welcome. We're glad to have you here with Thank us you. tonight. Um, so, do you want to just... Okay. So, I'm going to go ahead and um, start. So, we're going to dive in into the pool. Um, all aquatics programs have been moved back to the CRC pool. Um, also, our aquatics team um, went and attended the Association of Aquatics Professional Conference in Colorado Springs. Um, where they were part of the two different committees. Um, and then at this conference, they also received um, the 2022 Best of Aquatics Lifeguard Management Award, which was one of the nine presented at this um, conference. Um, for the month of February, aquatics continue with their training, focusing on first, emerge or first aid emergencies, including open wounds, burns, muscle, and bone injuries, 
as well as taking secondary assessments. Um, moving on to classes, um, we had a total of 1,340 participants, um, actually 1,678, I'm sorry, um, participants took part in different classes um, like flag football um, camp, watercoloring, painting, um, basketball skills, family music for babies, and creative writing for adults, just to name a few. Um, for the CRC, it still continues to be under um, renovations. Um, they did pour the new concrete in through the building and flooring should be installed pretty soon. Um, as um, In the meantime, CRC staff is preparing to um, start day camp um, hiring. Um, they are hiring for day camp um, and day camp starts shortly after the building opens. Um, for the skate park, um, the next scooter jam will be held on Saturday, March 25th. Um, they're still partnering up with Neighborhood Drop-In, and thanks again to Scooter Zone for donating prizes and giveaways. Um, as the CRC continues to be closed, the Teen Zone is also temporarily closed. Um, they're still running out of the Temecula Library and the skate park. Um, some of the crafts that they did this past month was a no-sew pillow, or heart pillow, uh, Valentine Grams um, and Oreo Love Bugs, um, and they still continue to do their seasonal theme boxes for ten dollars. Um, for homeless outreach, um, the February impact was ten street exits, bringing our year-to-date numbers to eighteen streets. Street exits um, on February seventh, our whole team was able to help out two female transits reunite with family in New Jersey. Um, city staff provided bus tickets for them. Um, they also were able to help two male transits um, with providing them with bus passes, snacks, hygiene kits, water, and hand warmers. Um, they did, um, a, one illegal encampment was identified and four of them were removed. Um, and thanks to Rancho Vista High School that um, donated hygiene kits to the help center. Moving on to the library. Um, the total impact was 16,665. Um, their in-person programs included Be My Valentine Craft, History of Temecula Talk, 24 Preschool Story Times, and My Strawberry Valentine Contest, which had 314 entries. Um, moving on to sports. Um, local youth leagues, baseball and softball spring season officially begin. Um, with opening ceremonies and games. Um, the city's adult softball league also began um, their spring season. And as you see, March weekends were full with tournaments. Um, special events. Um, they hosted TCSD Staff Appreciation Day on um, this past month. It was a Mardi Gras theme. Um, and 35 of our staff attended. Um, and they also welcomed a new staff to their team, Millie Avila. Um, and then also special, special events team is prepping for the Temecula Special Games, Teen Egg Hunt happening this month, and the Easter Egg Hunt in April. Now let's look at the theater. Um, we had 4,525 attendees um, with several sold out shows. Um, the first weekend we did open with Alice in Wonderland presented by our Temecula Presents student-led arts education musical theater internship program. And it was an awesome show. It was sold out um, for all the shows that they did present. Um, we did follow um, with, we ended the month with the Temecula Presents weekend um, that included Bohemian Queens, um, a queen, tribute to Queen, um, which was another of the sold out shows. We had Sherry Williams, the String Queens, and Jonathan Krant. For the Merc, um, we continue to have our Merc series featuring country jazz, speakeasy, stand-up comedy, classics, and Brazilian jazz. Um, country Live did feature Lily, and I'm gonna probably mess up this last name, John Kuskas, a high school senior. Um, and then Mark Jaffe was the feature comedian for stand-up comedy. Um, for Brazilian jazz, um, we had a special performance from Paulino Garcia, Brazilian trio, on February 17, and this was also a sold-out show. 
this concludes the first section. Um, if you have any questions, I can answer. Thank you very much. We appreciate Thanks. you being here with us tonight and delivering that very thorough report. We will go ahead and start with Commissioner Kingsford. I don't have any uh, questions per se. Just wanted to share that I continue to be really impressed with the uh, wide breadth of things that are offered um, and the fact that we had 1,678 participants in our contract classes and our main facility is, is under renovation, speaks to the ability to be able to pivot and serve the residents. And uh, I've been able to attend a couple of things in the theater and to see 4,500 people served uh, last month in February is great. So I uh, appreciate all you guys are doing. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. Thank you for the report. I have a couple of questions. The first one, you talk about day camp. Is that a new program we are starting? Hi, no, sorry. We do summer day camp every summer. Oh, summer, okay. Yes, we have uh, three age groups. We go from, was it from six up to 15? In three different age groups. So that's a long, long, long running okay. program. Okay, thank it's very, you. It's very popular. It sells out within right. minutes of the registration opening. Okay. Another question is when you say DIC uh, impacts, for example, for Teen Zone, you have 22 impacts, or for Library, you have 16,000. Is that a door count or? It just kind of depends on which one we're looking at. So um, if we could go back a couple of slides. Let's see if we can go to the library one. The library is good. Be oh, there we go. At the, the total impact in the upper right-hand corner is the sum of all those statistics you see down below on the left-hand side. So, or I'm sorry, the total impact represents the door count. But then we also count uh, circulated items, people who've checked in with questions, people who use self-checkout, Wi-Fi, people who attended different programs. When we run our summer reading program, you'll see a statistic for that. It will show how many kids are participating in summer reading. But the total impact is the number of people who attended the library during that month. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Vice Chaudhary. Thank you, Brunhilde, thank you. Great report. Right to the point. Thanks. It was awesome. And I agree with um, Commissioner Kingsburg on this, that um, this report really reflects that breadth of healthy activities that we offer. Um, you know, whether it's sports and, or culture, the theater, um, we're going to hear more about that next. But um, I think one of the things I didn't mention during the budget report, too, in regard to safety, the more healthy activities we have for our community to choose, the safer our community is because we are, we are actively participating in positive things. And the other thing, you know, it's, it's so much um, sets a tone for the culture of our town and our city and keeps it wholesome and gives us a guideline as we go through our quality of life master plan to look at this is really what we want in our community. And um, CCSD just does so much to, to provide that. And thanks for um, bringing that out in your report. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Thank you for those comments, uh, Vice Chair. I did want to, that brought up a thought for me. As many of you know, we now have um, a, a, a unit of Riverside Sheriff's Office embedded with uh, TCSD on the second floor. It's the, their core team, which stands for Community Outreach Resources and Engagement. And um, I think all of our staff would agree that having them there has been really eye-opening for us in a lot of ways. It's been really valuable in other ways. But one of the things that strikes me is that a lot of times the problems they're dealing with are the sort of societal issues that we hope we can prevent by providing resources to our community and providing opportunities for kids to be constructively engaged mm -hmm. after school and to have exposure to the arts and so forth. So, and physical activity and outdoor exposure. So having their team with our team has really highlighted for me the importance of what we do, as you were just mentioning, in terms of building not just a fun community, but a safe one. Thank you very much. A again, uh, I was struck by just um, the diversity of programming we have going on at the theater, just uh, diversity of culture and art that's uh, exhibited there is, is really impressive. Um, another thing that stood out to me was the training for our aquatic staff. I'm really, I'm, I'm really impressed. I know we had Colin Curley last year with, you know, what he he was able to do with his 
training um, and saving a life in uh, Huntington Beach. Um, just seeing the continuous training going on in our aquatics department, that's, pretty, that's really impressive. You know, knowing that it's not just impacting our city, but it's, it's impacting a greater region. So. Yeah, it expands well beyond the bounds of the pool. You know, they, mm -hmm. keep, they keep our participants safe, but every one of those people is a very highly trained, you know, safety professional out in their daily lives. Well, you mentioned they were, one of their training they were getting was for um, burn wounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, and it, it, goes, it goes beyond just um, keeping people safe on deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our aquatics team, uh, particularly Gwen, Melissa, and Kristen, are mm -hmm. extremely dedicated to what they do, and they're mm -hmm. very, very highly qualified professionals, and I think they hold safety and as the highest priority. Well, I'm very impressed, too, seeing that they are um, leaving the region and extending their educational opportunities in, in, in running aquatics department. So that, that's really impressive. Great, great work. All right, our next department report will be our cultural arts report, and we have Bella Carson here with us tonight to share that with us. Good evening, commissioners. For those who I haven't met, I'm Bella Carson. I'm a recreation leader at the Temecula Valley Museum. Um, we're gonna start with our arts and culture report for art galleries and our art nights, formerly Art Off the Walls. Um, the arts and culture team hosted art nights, formerly Art Off the Walls, and gallery reception on Friday, February 3rd, and guests viewed an array of artists on the lawn on Main and connected with the gallery at the Merck featured artist Anne Pelage. Complimentary refreshments and live music were provided for guests to enjoy, and the free event welcomed 175 attendees. Ms. Mrs. Pelage's gallery was titled Outside the Lines. This was her first solo gallery exhibit, as a visual, and as a visually impaired artist, she must relearn and adapt to even simple tasks. Painting has given her the ability to have freedom to relearn a skill at her own pace. Our art gallery showcases had the following. In observance of Black History Month, the Rotunda Gallery at the Temecula Valley Museum displayed original early 1960s voting rights posters, including two featuring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The last day to view this gallery is March 12th. The gallery at the Ronald H. Roberts Temecula Public Library features Tashina Kotke's photography. The uh, collection is called Introspection, a photographic series that presents hands holding objects that tell stories of each of her subjects. The Civic Center Gallery features Faces, an artistic study on human faces and emotions by Ron Furkovich, which you can see just out in the hallway. And Mrs. Pelage's exhibit at the Gallery at the Merck concluded on February 26th. The community outreach had over 32,043 total views and reaches of over 79,203. For stats, the team posted three reels with more than 24,600 views. These featured preparedness backpack, culture days, and classes and program. The 12 promotional posts from both social media platforms brought over 79,230 reaches. TCSD's community outreach team has started the new year off with several video projects, social media programming, and other department assignments. Our current and upcoming projects are creation of two new logos, including Expo and Culture Days, rebranding Art Nights, formerly Art Off the Walls, and Art Fest, formerly Art and Street Painting Festival. Next is inclusive services. So on February 3rd, 60 par participants had a great time at the High Hopes Game Night event with DJ Jeff Waddleton at the MPSC. Games included Jeopardy, Pictionary, and Wheel of Fortune. Participants had a great night and didn't want it to end. On February 17th, 90 participants attended the High Hopes Valentine's Dance at the MPSC. DJ Waddleton provided music for participants to dance to. We also crowned the Valentine's King and Queen, a favorite High Hopes tradition. A big thank you to Ready Commission Chair Jackie Steed for providing extra support and love to this special event. The Youth Advisory Council packed seeds with Vlada Vladik from Vlada's Seeds of Life for the Little Sprouts program. Additionally, they assisted with crafts and activities for the Skip and High Hopes Valentine's events. Youth Advisory Council meetings are held every Wednesday from five to six at the MPSC. The first inclusive visual arts session of the year concluded this month. Participants learned about color theory and created individual projects with techniques that were learned. On February 8th, we hosted Skip Valentine's Day at the MSPC. 
participants created origami heart bookmarks and decorated their own goodie bags for their Valentine's Day exchange with fellow participants. Additionally, we had a special performance for some of the Skip kids who wanted to sing. They performed covers of the Bee Gees and even got Rickrolled with Rick Astley's Never Gonna Give You Up. Uh, now I'll look at senior services. The, MS, the MPSC will be hosting the AARP tax aid program every Friday this tax season from February 3rd to February 14th. This is a free in-person tax preparation program and has helped serve 81 households, including some of our own MSPC seniors. This month, 28 participants were assisted with basic technology needs, such as setting up their cell phone, tablets, and computers. On February 8th, seniors were transported via the Human Services Shuttle on the trip to Balboa Park, and they enjoyed a wonderful lunch and quality time with one another. In February, seniors created candy-filled Tootsie Rolls and decorated heart-shaped cookies as well as painted wooden birdhouses in the Senior Arts and Crafts Program. The February Warm Center total impact was 300 participants. Temporary relief from the cold was available when the daytime temperature drops below 40 degrees. The MSPC will be temporarily close to the public while undergoing renovations and facility enhancements. And essential services will be moved to the Temecula Community Center while other programs will be put on hold until fall 2023. The Temecula Valley Museum hosted over 1,800 patrons in the month of February. The tattooed and tenacious inked women in California's history continue to be on display this month, and many visitors share their creative tattoo designs for the Draw a Tattoo activity available in the Art and Education Room. The exhibit will be on display until March 19th. In late February, the Temecula Valley Museum received a donation from Dorothy Gardner of a woven basket created by the weaver Juanita Anejo, who resided in our region in years past. We also received two donated typewriters from Don and Charlotte Fox. We are sad to inform that Richard Dix Fox passed on February 12th. He was a valued member of TVM and Temecula Valley History Society. A memorial service at the Chapel of Memories will be held June 15th, 2023. On February 11th, we celebrated New Zealand during our Culture Days event. Food and refreshments included pavlova and kiwi candies. Free art lesson was offered by Tony Moromorco at Bigfoot Art Classes. This event is formally known as Second Saturday Cultural Celebrations. In the month of February, we hosted four group tours and received thank you notes and drawings from Rancho Elementary. And our knowledgeable staff member, Juliana Hansen, gave a history presentation at the Ronald H. Roberts Library. Here's some upcoming events in March and April through Museum Arts and Culture. We have a new exhibit, Temecula Unified School District artwork will be on display from March 20th until April 6th. The exhibit will include middle and high school student artwork. Friday, April 7th from five to eight is an art nights, along with featuring mighty mini masterpieces in the Murph Gallery. On April 8th, join us at the Temecula Valley Museum to celebrate the beautiful country of Macedonia. This country was requested by Commissioner Krzyzewski as his wife and parents are from Macedonia, and we look forward to sharing um, this culture with our community. Uh, the workforce development had an impact of 71 participants and students held three meetings averaging 11 high school students per meeting. Students facilitate youth programs and city events such as Junior STEM, College Fair, Rocktober, and more. The Junior STEM program held its fifth meeting of the school year on February 8th with 22 middle school students in attendance. Our internship fellowship program is offered year round to undergraduate and graduate college students. Currently there are 16 interns completing their internships in the following departments. Community services, economic development, emergency management, finance, IT and support services and public works. And that concludes my report and um, if there's any questions. Thank you very much fellow. We appreciate having you here tonight. That was a very great report, thank you. So we will go ahead and start with comments from Commissioner Hicks. Thank you, Bella, for the thorough report. Since we are talking about, we had a report of the budget, I'm wondering that when we budget, how is it work for all these different programs? Again, I'm impressed with the variety of programs for kids or just different members of our community, but then I'm wondering what's the process of allocating different funds to each program? 
So um, the budget is approved by council, and when we submit a budget, it is divided into uh, by departments, and community services actually has its own fund, which is separate from the general fund. And then within the TCSD fund, we have maybe 12 to 13 different divisions. So for example, uh, the History Museum and Arts and Culture are one division. Uh, the theater is its own division. Uh, Mary Phillips and Inclusive, Senior Center and Inclusive Services are one division. So the, within these divisions, they have uh, kind of typical line items for common expenditure categories, which would include all the personnel line items, um, rec supplies, office supplies, other outside services. Um, those are just some of the common items. Within those, the, the manager of each division has a lot of latitude in terms of how they end up allocating those funds. So for example, just to use Dawn's budget as an example, because she has a huge line item for special events. Um, at her level, she kind of allocates this much money goes to Rod Run, this much goes to the 4th of July, this much goes to Christmas. Council doesn't weigh in like at the individual event level, if that mm -hmm. makes sense, the kind of broad categories. Um, uh, Bea, was there anything you wanted to add on that one? Oh no, I was just gonna explain that. Okay, process. gotcha. Okay, does that, yes. does that explain? Okay. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Hawks. Commissioner Ginsburg. Thank you, Bella. Appreciate the report. Uh, very, very well stated and spoken. Um, I don't, I don't have too much. I, again, I, I noted the two high hopes events, both the uh, the game night and the Valentine's dance. That's great. There were two events in that in that short month. Um, and then, in relation to the special needs youth, it appeared there's another acronym, a, a skip. Could you could you guys explain that? I'm not familiar with that particular group? Yeah, SKIP is an acronym for supporting kids, including parents. Okay. And that is specifically a program to support um, families with special needs and children under the age of 18. So the High Got Hopes it. program is for young adults with special yeah. needs, but SKIP focuses more on families with younger children with special needs. Great, great. I, I sort of surmise that. Thank you for that, that no clarification. Problem. It's perfect. And then just another little curiosity from the, the culture days. I, I, I didn't note any any data on on, on attendees uh, uh, with New Zealand. I don't know if you're able to share that. And I'm just kind of curious if you guys have been doing this for a while. Are you seeing patterns of certain times of the year where these culture days are better attended? I know the weather's been problematic or, as well, at least compared to what we're used to. So okay. just kind of curious how those are going. Yeah, it definitely varies throughout the year. So the colder months, you know, people are kind of coming off the holidays. They don't really want to leave the house sometimes, and it's it's just a little mm -hmm. too cold for kids sometimes, especially if it's raining. We do some of our activities outside, um, and the same goes for in the summertime. With we get the extreme heats, it's kind of the same thing. People don't, um, you know, want to leave air conditioning, or if we're doing activities outside, then that kind of impacts that. But we do have a very regular attendance. I know right. we just had one last Saturday where we actually had quite a large attendance of over 200 people. Um, but I think our average is 150 to 200 almost every month. Yeah, the Israel uh, Culture Days brought 280 guests. You can wow. see it in the photo stream. Um, I know the Chinese New Year also brings a large crowd. So when there are groups or organizations that are aware, church mm -hmm. groups, mm -hmm. you know, they bring the whole family. But there are the steady ones that come no matter what culture it is. What's nice is they put together a nice little passport. So this has been going on since 2019, and even throughout the uh, pandemic, it was all done virtual. So you can see all of the uh, cultures that have been um, featured so far online, and um, there are activities and uh, scavenger hunts and recipes and all kinds of things the way we celebrate culture. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Kingsburg. Bryce Trotty. Well, thank you. Great report. Um, I, th I think, well, number one, I think Macedonia might beat Israel out. Um, so we'll have to <laughs> get to um, Commissioner Emeritus Krzyzewski and see if he can pump that up a little bit. I, I, I say that in just, but I mean, the, the, the diversity of the arts the diversity of how we are educating the public about diverse cultures, um, how we serve a diverse um, 
population of, of folks from special needs to seniors to um, young children um, is just so impressive. And you know, speaking of that, as we are in um, Women's International History Month, um, I think it's important to note, we had amazing reports from Bell and Hilda tonight, um, but our dais is all women, strong leaders who make what we're seeing here tonight um, happen. And um, we were, are really, really blessed here in Temecula with strong women leaders. Now, being the father of three daughters, um, I have always been an advocate. I mean, sometimes people think I'm, I support these women things because I had three daughters. No, I've always been an advocate for women as a coach, a teacher, um, involved in the community, um, pushing women to be in leadership roles, pushing women to do things they haven't done before in the areas of science and math. And um, I think that um, you should be very, very proud for what you've accomplished and your great role models for our community. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Adi. And I will just add, I know last month you guys shared with us that the Culture Days logo was brand new. And I just have been looking at it the last few um, days. I've seen it on social media as you were promoting Israel. I really like it. I took me, um, I had to take a, a good look at it instead of just glancing. And I realized it wasn't just a yellow ball, it was the globe as part of it. it was Thank very you. Katrina Thorson is a very talented brander and she creates all these just out of her head and heart and we're trying to brand it along with Culture Fest so that's why it has a similar uh -huh. look and feel but then we wanted to we want the, the logo itself to speak a thousand words mm -hmm. and languages so building in the globe having the sun having all of that yeah. vibrancy of color mm -hmm. diversity is um, you know just speaks volume so she's very talented and then we all contribute our mm -hmm. input but she just continues to churn out outstanding branded wor art works of art yeah. I mean everything that she does is frame worthy thank you yeah last month I was like oh that's pretty and then this you know month looking at it I mean how thoughtful and things are standing out so it's really impressive so thank you Thank you for all you do. All right, moving on, we will go to our consent calendar. We have one item on our consent calendar, which is to approve our action minutes from our last meeting on February 13, 2023. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes? Move to approve. And a second. I'll second. All right, so motion from Vice Chair Audi and a second from Commissioner Kingsburg. I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Hawks? Aye. Commissioner Kingsburg? Aye. Vice Chair Audi? Aye. And Chairperson Sizemore? Aye. So the motion is approved four to zero with Commissioner Castro absent. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, we will go to, we've already done our business items, so we will go to our director's report. Director Russo. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you are um, interested in engaging in the budget process in more detail, there will be that budget workshop that will be coming up in May. Great opportunity to, it's open to the public, it will be over in the conference center, and you can just observe the full budget presentation at that point. Um, beyond that, the existing budget, possibly past budgets, definitely the existing budget is available on the city's website. It is obviously a lengthy and involved document. Um, there are three main documents, just so you know kind of what you're looking for. There's the annual operating budget, or the AOB, and that includes kind of the high-level view of all of the funds and the accounts and how much is allocated and everything, as well as some background about all the different departments and what they do. And then there's the line item detail, which takes each one of those and breaks it down into every single line item. And I. I think that's probably more detail than anyone really is interested in at this point. And then the third document that's worth taking a look at is the Capital Improvement Project Budget, which is a separate document. Um, I believe in Jen's uh, presentation, we're up to $801 million in that, which 
far exceeds the size of capital improvement budgets for many much larger cities. Um, around the time that the budget goes to council, I will also bring back a summary to this group of the capital improvement projects. And as she was mentioning, those are divided into four categories. We have um, the SARTA, which is our affordable housing infrastructure, which includes any you know, infrastructure that is not traffic related. Then we have the traffic component, then we have the community services component. Almost everything that impacts our department is either in that community services section or in the infrastructure section. So um, when I bring that summary to you, I will also be bringing a summary of any of the projects that impact community services specifically, including, um, as uh, Commissioner Hawks brought up, the park improvement uh, project, which Stacy Fox was kind enough to cover last time. So just as a high level overview, but if you are interested, everything's available on the website. You can dig around to your heart's content, but three big documents, the AOB overview, the line item detail, and the CIP, and I would recommend kind of sticking with the AOB overview, and the, which is still very detailed. It's still like this thick when it's printed, and the CIP. And um, that's all for me this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Director Russo. And I'm going to ask a point of order. order. I do see that we have our um, city council presentation tomorrow, and we have our, shall I say, script for our presentation. Mm -hmm. Is this something that we should be practicing on the record or no we're going to do that after we adjourn and okay. then we're just going to go over our portions very um, informally and okay. then tomorrow will be the opening night okay just wanting to clarify for uh, just to clarify since you'll be practicing that after adjournment you can't discuss it with each other okay since it's outside so of we're the stuck context. to the script you're gonna if you have any feedback you can provide it one-on-one -on -one to staff but okay. you you can't discuss it amongst yourself. So we'll just have to like go impromptu tomorrow. Go rogue. Yeah. Or if you know provide feedback to. to staff and they can certainly make any changes. So. Okay. Awesome. For go rogue. If you have <laughs> any or questions now on the record that you want to ask but going over slide by slide okay. isn't recommended because right. we want it to be fresh for council tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. We'll go to our commissioner reports and we'll start with Vice Chair Audi. I, um, just one quick thing. I've, I've been able to attend the Ready Commission a couple of um, the last two um, meetings for them. And um, the one thing that really jumped out at me was the um, connection we have with race, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I mean, I brought that up just a, a while ago on those reports, how, how it just stands out, how we are... Um, so connected with that in educating our our community. So um, I just um, you know wanted to publicly say they do a, a really good job. They've done a fantastic job with those proclamations that were sent down that way, um, and um, have enjoyed those those two presentations for their their proclamations, and um, hope to continue to do. Some great work with them. Thank you, Vice Chair. We like to think of that commission as our sister commission because we're very close. We work very well with city clerk, the executive director, Randy Joel, and we support each other very much. They, the Ready Commission really comes through for us, especially at Culture Days and anything that we've asked, they really support us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Hawks? I have two items to report. The first one, about a month ago, I contacted Tracy to volunteer for the special game that will happen this Saturday. And I was told that we have more than enough volunteers. It was turned down, so that's a great pro problem to have. So I really am very impressed with the amount of involvement from our community and our volunteers, so thank you. And the second item is, I attended a 5K race this last Saturday for the first time. It's a private event, and it's a great turnout. I was really surprised considering the weather after a full day of rain Friday. So I'm thinking that if we can put on a similar race for the spring, I know we have a color run in the fall. I think we have great turnouts of 2,500 plus. So Seems like there is great interest if we can have one in the spring that might add more fun to our community and the healthy living. Thank you, 
you, Commissioner Hawks. Commissioner Kingsley. Thank you, Chair Sizemore. Uh, yeah, I have a few things to report out on. Um, I uh, was at the Senior Center on February 16th uh, for their Valentine's uh, Week event and had a very nice time there. Uh, the senior choir performed and uh, they put me to work, which was great. I, I got to serve uh, the seniors, uh, make sure they got their appetizers. Uh, and then they gave out tons of raffle prizes, uh, which was awesome. Um, and I got to deliver those. So it was a lot of fun to reconnect uh, with that group. And then I, uh, my wife and I attended the art night just as, as residents on 3-3 um, on um, and uh, went to the Merck and saw the exhibit there and the, and the artists there and then also the outside vendors. So it was nice to be able to support the, the local artists um, here. And then that led right into the, the Billy Nation concert that I mentioned last time. So it was a great Friday night out out locally. Um, and then last week, um, I was able to make it over to the, uh, the unveiling of the Cesar Chavez mural uh, by the Great Oak students. And uh, it is absolutely spectacular. I mean, I, I, I cannot imagine, you know, back in, in teaching years, it's like, okay, 100 out of 100. I mean, this is 1,000 out of 1,000. It is, it is really, really impressive up, up close. Um, so that was neat to be able to be a part of that and, and see some of the students and join some of the other staff. And then finally, um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, the Vice Chair Audi because not only did, did Supervisor Washington and Mayor Schwank speak, but Vice Chair Audi offered public comments at the, uh, at the Ready Commission. I, I was at that meeting as well. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do is try to get to know the other commissions. And so it was, I was just, I mentioned that because I was just so impressed uh, with the commission. And I know they've had uh, uh, a lot of uh, responsibilities that have come their way very quickly and they, they're doing an incredible job. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation on um, uh, Women's History Month and I think the audience really appreciated it. And uh, uh, I'm gonna double down uh, with Vice Chair Audie on this as well with, as the father of daughters and the, father, and the grandfather of a granddaughter. Um, it's just great to see women leading and, and doing great things. So you guys all keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kingsford. And I would like to, first of all, I wanna thank staff for always just being on top of it and responding to all of my questions, comments, concerns very quickly. Thank you, Don. Don took, did a great job while you were gone, Erica. She took care of everything. And I also wanna thank you, Erica, for being very responsive whenever I had any concerns. Oh, more than happy. And yes, Don, Don did a great job. Everybody uh, at this day has helped out. And uh, I, I never have any worries when I leave for anything. I know everything will be handled by this great team of professionals we have. So thank you. That's great. And I did wanna take a moment. I, I hope Commissioner Castro um, watches over our meeting. I wanted to say congratulations to, to the new grandpa. I hope he's enjoying time with his family getting to enjoy his new grandchild and getting to bond together as a family during that special time. So we miss you, Commissioner Castro, but we're, we're excited for this new future. Is it Temecula Resident? No. No? Still adoptees. Well, we look forward to one day when your family wants to move to Temecula mm -hmm. and uh, we, we can uh, and show them the, the wonderful community services we have here. So, and with that, I will go ahead and adjourn our meeting. And our next meeting will be, let's see, Monday, April the 10th at 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. <laughs>